Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Star Trek Discovery Season 2 Episode 8 If Memory Serves. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review episodes of Star Trek Discovery. So I have to start with a spoiler warning for Discovery up to Season 2 Episode 8. If you haven't seen up to this point you will not want to watch this video otherwise some things will be spoiled for you. So, um, this latest episode of Discovery it was really good. I really enjoyed it. I think this may be perhaps the strongest episode of the entire show. I think definitely the strongest episode of the season. Uh, in my opinion, this is an opinion that seems to be widely shared. I uh, saw so, uh, currently it's the highest rated episode on IMDb at the moment. Highest by far, I should say. Um, so here's the thing. Like... The term fan service, I think different people define it different ways. Uh, I'd, oh, I'd latched on to the definition of fan service that fan service by definition is something that um, is done to please the fans but at the expense of the plot. Like at the expense of the characters, at the expense of the storyline, it doesn't really fit into the story, it feels out of place, but they just did it in there because, oh, fans will like it. Uh, I always give the uh, last episode, or most of actually, of season seven of Game of Thrones as examples of that, has especially the White Dragon as an example of fan service. It doesn't really fit the story, it doesn't help the story, it doesn't really fit into the characters, but hey, fans wanted to see it, so let's do it. Uh, so in that way, there's no such thing as good ser fan service because by definition, fan service is is destructive to the storyline by its nature. Although that's just one definition. I know other people might define the fan service as simply trying to appease the fans or trying to give the fans something that they want, in which case there could be such a thing as good fan service because there's a lot of times where you can appease the fans and not only... Is it not destructive to the story or to the show? It actually, sometimes it actually enhances the show to try to give fans what they want. So it depends on how you define it. So by my first definition of fan service, this episode is not fan service. But by my second, de you know, the second definition of fan service, this is, would be good fan service. It's kind of like... Uh, trials and tribulations or a few other examples where fans are really pleased but they do it in such a way that it works for the show uh, and it works for the characters and it fits in nicely and in fact enhances the show now I you know I've always been complaining whenever they make references to the original series like when they had Harry Mudd in there I wasn't very happy about it and I've been saying from the beginning I wish they didn't have Sarek or Spock I wish they just created new characters for it and uh, every once in a while we get like references to the original series like ho 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 like we see like a, a Gorn skeleton or a Tribble or something oh see we've seen the original series too and that stuff I still say it's I don't like because it's kind of shameless, doesn't really fit, it's just there to sort of be like ho 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 to the piece of fans and it doesn't contribute anything to the show. And that is totally not what I think about the Talosians. Now granted, in the previous episode when they first mentioned Talos 4, I did think, oh god, this is more of that, this is more of the ho 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 Talos 4, we've seen the original series too. But after watching this episode, I see that that's not the case that they actually found a way to make this to reference uh, the original series, but make it fit into the character stories and the main storyline of Discovery. And the way they did this, I thought, was actually fantastic, spectacular. It was almost like we got a long-awaited sequel uh, to The Cage, uh, kind of a prequel to the Menagerie, too, if that makes any sense. Uh, and uh, and it, it worked. It fit. Like, it all gelled well. It worked really well for the characters, particularly Pike. Uh, I thought it was immensely satisfying. I thought it enhanced the current storyline of Season 2 of Discovery to make me more interested in that. So just outside of any referential things to the original series, this work for Discovery itself uh, and help push this story along and make me more interested in it. So overall, I see this episode as a huge success. That being said, I don't think it was perfect. 
there were some issues I had with this episode as well. So I actually decided I'm going to structure this review as pros and cons. Uh, rather than go through the storylines, each storyline separately, I'm going to structure it where I'm going to talk about all the pros first, everything I liked about the episode, which, by the way, I think far outweigh the cons. As I said, I think this was a really good episode. But then at the end, I'm going to get into some of the drawbacks, why I don't think this episode was perfect. Anyway, so let's start with some pros. Uh, the the episode begins with the previously on, where we, they all show in, um, footage from the cage. Now, I'm putting this in the pros section, but I'm not that positive. I was kind of mixed on this at first. Because at first, I was like, oh, well, that's a bit silly. That's a bit pandering <laughs> to the fans of the original series. But I think it's unique. I, I actually liked it a lot, I think. Uh, I mean, it's. I think it's obviously there for those who hadn't seen that episode of the original series to give some background context. Uh, and I like that they did it even though it's very, of course, the visual style and look is extremely outdated compared to Discovery. And there's different actors playing Pike, different actors playing Vina, different actors playing Spock. And, of course, the Talosians look totally different as well. But I love that they didn't care about that and they did that anyway. And I love, like, the hard cut, how they go end on Jeffrey Hunter's Pike and then transition to Anson Mount as Pike and to make it clear that this is the same guy. Uh, I love that and I think, and as I said, I think it was great setup for the episode because I think the episode does almost read like a sequel or continuation uh, to the cage. Uh, so that I think was actually a brilliant idea once I think about it. Now, another thing I really liked was Spock and Michael Burnham's relationship. Because this is um, the first episode where we really get full Spock, you know, kind of interaction. Because the previous episode, he was just mumbling and being incoherent. But here, and I love how at the start of the episode, he's incoherent. But he's coherent enough that when... Uh, Burnham, uh, you know, flies the shuttle into Talos and then she sees a black hole and she, of course she wants to turn around but Spock like fights her and forces her down. Uh, like that was cool because even though he was in Grand, he knew enough that this was just an illusion from the, the Talosians. Which again, I love how this feed, it felt like the Talosians, this felt like a continuation of the cage because of Things like that, the way the Talosians would have all these illusions that make you think you're going to die uh, to try to trick you, which feels exactly like the stuff that they did in Cage. And by the way, the Cage had always been one of my favorite uh, episodes of the original series growing up. So <laughs> I thought that was, um, yeah, so it felt connected. It felt like in character for the Talosians. It made perfect sense. And so... Once they got to the planet, I love how, like, you know, Michael Burnham made this deal with the Talosians to, um, you know, um, for them to reveal what was going on with Spock, and she got to see the vision of the Red Angel, and when Spock turned after that, he's coherent, and he says, now you understand. Like, that was... That was great, and I love like the interactions between Burnham and Spock throughout this episode, the way they were sort of quipping at each other, as they were obviously had a very uh, rough uh, relationship, but yet they needed each other uh, for this current situation, uh, and how Burnham was continually trying to, you know, reach an olive branch to Spock, but Spock was continually re rejecting that. I thought that was... That all worked really well. Now, Talosians themselves, as I said, I thought... The I love them. I love their inclusion. I thought what they did, like worked for the episode. It felt totally in character with how they've been established in the cage. I like the new look for them because I think it looks. I compare this like to the new look of the clans because new look of the clans. A lot of people will fight me on this um, of why I hate this look so much. And they say, well, they're going to have to change and update the look. But I think you can update a look of an alien in such a way where it's, where it's different and more modern, but still consistent with what it came before. And what they did to the Klingons was just disgusting and awful. It just made, made them feel like a totally different alien. They didn't feel like Klingons anymore. But with the Talosians, I think this is ch changing uh, the look in a way that 
is right. They're doing it the right way in a way that works. Where it, it, because you can't do this the Telosians the way they looked in the 60s because that was all cheesy with the big bubble heads going blah, 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 blah. And so the way they did it felt like the Telosians. It looked enough like the 60s version to to make you buy that they're the same aliens. And uh, But it was updated enough to make it not look cheesy, to look like it fit in the world of Discovery. So I thought that was perfect. Uh, I was very happy with it. I was happy with... You know, throughout the episode we got a, particularly a lot of um, sound effects and stuff were very reminiscent of the sound effects in the cage, but updated so it didn't feel like a cheesy 60s thing. It felt like it fit in the world of Discovery. Like the singing plants, for example, like that was established in the cage um, with, you know, Spock in the cage. He touched the plant and it stopped singing and they had Burnham do the same thing in this episode, but the plants looked better, better special effects, but the sound that they made was very similar to the singing that they did in, in the cage, except it it fit in the world of Discovery. And some of the sound effects when the Telosians did their illusions, how they transitioned, it was very similar to the sound effects that they did in the cage, but updated so it didn't sound cheesy in the 60s, but it felt like it fit more into this modern storytelling in the world of Discovery. Um... And it's, but it's, uh, but it was actually also reminiscent of what they did in the cage at the same time. So, so that was great. <laughs> I thought that worked really, really well. And I thought the behavior of the Telosians, again, fit perfectly. Because in the cage you were a bit more hostile, but the cage ended with them sort of coming to an understanding uh, with, you know, the, the Starfleet or with the humans, so there would be less hostile now. Um, and this also sort of transitions into the Menagerie, where the, the Telosians are actually in league with Spock and working with him to get Pike to back to the planet, uh, which I thought worked very well. Now, I think <laughs> the timeline is a bit muddied a bit, because in the pilot episode of The Cage, that episode ended with um, the Telosians creating a, a version of Pike for um, Vina to go off with and have fun with. But then, when they restructured The Cage for the Menagerie, they kind of changed that ending to have it so um, that never happened in 13 years ago when Pike visited the planet. He never saw a version of himself go off with Vina and knew that he was happy, but instead they reused that clip to have it so once uh, Spock brought the injured Pike um, back to Talos 4 during the Enterprise times, during the Menagerie, uh, during the Kirk times I should say, uh, once he brought Pike back then the Telusians gave Pike the illusion that he was healthy and fit again, so he went off with uh, Vina and they lived happily ever after. So there was actually two different versions of this. Uh, and I think you could say that the Menagerie was the official canon version because that was officially aired uh, as part of the Star Trek, the original series, where the cage wasn't. It was just a lost episode that was released like a couple decades later. So I think that's what they kind of took from both of them, though, because I think from Pike's perspective, he uh, never saw Vina go off with a version of him, but Vina did go off with a version of him because she made references to it. She was like, oh, I, you know, when she sees Pike, she's like, oh, I'm surprised that you're, um, uh, that you're so angry. I'm not used to you being scared of me or stuff like that. And Pike doesn't know what she's talking about. So they're sort of making it so the I guess they're going halfway. So they're making it so Vina did go off with an illusion of Pike, but Pike didn't see this, so he's not aware of this, which is, as I said, it contradicts the cage, but it goes along with the Menagerie, because this never happened in the Menagerie. Uh, so, um, so Pike is still, um, yeah, so he still doesn't know what he's talking about, but the Telosians did do it, and of course this makes it free, so uh, ten years after this episode takes place that Pike will eventually return to Telos for and he will be turned into, uh, made an illusion to make it feel like he's healthy and he spends the rest of his life uh, with Vina. 
Which I think I've, that sort of blends into another thing I want to get into that I really liked about this episode is the Pike uh, relationship with Vina. I thought that was absolutely amazing. I thought the scenes with her appearing to him. I mean, sometimes it's hard for me to think of this Pike as Pike because Pike from the cage is totally different characteristic. I think to say, oh, that's a rough time in his life, so that explains why he's such a different character. I don't think that quite works. He's just, it wasn't just the fact that it was a rough time in his life. It's just his whole entire demeanor and behavior characteristics was completely different, so sometimes it's hard for me to... But I think this episode did a good job of overcoming that, of making me forget that. Of Especially, like, the relationship he had with Vina and how... I think it's important to establish for the continuity of the Menagerie how important that event was to him and how important she was to him and how, like, seeing her again was very emotional for her and, uh, and he was very... You could tell that he still loved her because he's like, I wish he would have went with me instead of staying behind because at this point he's again as i said he's still unaware that she's actually been living her life with an illusion of him the part of him that stayed behind i love how she explained that i think that was absolutely amazing it was very emotional it worked for the the story of this episode it worked for the character of pike and this is also establishing uh, what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen? Because eventually, you know, Pike gets injured in a wheelchair that only blink just to know. <laughs> it was just stupid. But, um, and Spock takes him back to Talos Four, and he lives the rest of his life with Vina. So it's establishing that, that that's where, what his destiny is, basically. That's how he spends the rest of his life. He retires on Talos Four with Vina, and they live happily ever after. Uh, so this is setting up for that by showing how important uh, she is for him, uh, and I love that. And I think, and I, as I said, I think like the way Vina communicated him, with him on the Discovery in order to relay the information that Burnham and Spock needed him. But I love how she was the one to reach out to him at first, and then, uh, then they went over and showed Burnham and Spock, and then they talked to him because it, it proved to him that um that this could be trusted it just wasn't uh, a delusion or he wasn't being crazy because he knows about the delusions uh so i think that worked extremely well i think it was extremely emotionally powerful a uh, very effective storytelling uh, that i really liked now getting back to spock and burnham uh how you know how i talked about how burnham when she first came she got the visions of what spock went through and exactly what happened to him what happened with the red angel uh so we get very um you know needed exposition on the red angel uh that the red angel saved uh, michael burnham's life and appeared to spock in order to save her life when she was a child uh and that spock had uh mind melded with it and saw that it was just a human but by somehow doing so it's because it's a time traveler from the future is knocked his sort of brain out of time and time was the one thing that kept his had kept him sane so that's why he needed telogians to go and rearrange his mind because that's something that modern medicine wouldn't be able to handle so he knew that the Telosians were the only ones who could help him which I love that I think that was a great uh, way to instead of being like oh, ho ho here are the Telosians this actually works for the story it makes a lot of sense it's very logical <laughs> shall I say uh, and plus it gives us very needed uh, and necessary exposition on what the Red Angel is uh, so this is a and I'm not going to get too much into the, the speculation <laughs> of what the Red Angel is because uh, a lot of people think it's future Michael Burnham, which I really hope it is not future Michael Burnham. However, the way that they're playing it up, it does make me think if it is like a totally new character we never met before and has nothing to do with anything already established, it's going to be kind of disappointing because they're kind of playing it up like the revelation is going to be this huge aha revelation, which I, there's some drawbacks to that because they're setting expectations high, which means they are setting themselves up an impossible task, really, or not impossible, but a difficult one to try to make this uh, big reveal satisfying when they're building it up so much. 
if it's featured Michael Burnham, I've heard so, I don't know if I've heard anyone who liked that idea. <laughs> Everyone was saying that's a stupid idea. So I really hope that it's not that. Also, like, it creates a bit of a time paradox because if the Red Angel traveled back in time to save Michael Burnham's life, then how could it be future Michael Burnham? Because Michael Burnham wouldn't have died, but I don't know. Star Trek has done a time paradox like this before, too, so I wouldn't put it past them. Uh, but I hope that's not the case. I think that it might tie into the Picard show. I was thinking they could even have it be like a future version of Picard, because they're setting up like the Section 31 show, so I think maybe what if they do the same thing with setting up the Picard show? I don't... I don't think I'd like that either. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's it's. I can't think of very many scenarios that I think would really pay off. Which so I think if the show is really good, if it proves itself to be awesome, it will make this work uh, because it will do something that I can't even think of or ex anticipate or expect. Uh, but what? But as far as this episode goes, we get it pushes the Red Angel story further. It gives us more information. Spock confirms uh, definitely, definitively that this is in fact a human being inside uh, the suit. Um, now I've heard some theories that they could, in fact, still be Spock because Spock could is half human so maybe the young Spock was just picking up on the human half but I don't know again yeah. <laughs> I think that if it was future Spock that might be better than it being future Michael Burnham but I still wouldn't be that happy with it but anyway we know it's a human being so I think that's that's really setting things up and giving us more uh, information uh, so Another thing uh, that uh, we learned when Michael Burnham was like in the Spock's mind or seeing his flashbacks is seeing him in the mental institution and uh, coming to the realization that the Red Angel, that there's this apocalypse coming and the Red Angel is trying to stop it and so he realizes this so he wants to leave but they refuse to let him leave so he, you know, gives him the Vulcan, Vulcan nerve pinch and breaks out. And I love the interactions between, I love how they insert Michael Burnham into this and Michael Burnham is like, Oh, so you didn't kill anyone? And Spock is just gets pissed at her and is like, so you need, this isn't good enough for you? You doubt me that much that you can't trust your own eyes? Do you see murder here? Uh, so, but I think Spock was being unreasonable because I think that's a perfectly, I think because Michael Burnham, if he knew uh, like from, he, if Spock didn't know from the earlier seasons, the entire season, Burnham and Pike totally did not believe for a single second that Spock had killed uh, people. They for, doubted this instantly. Uh, but, so I think it is logical. It, it makes a lot of sense for Burnham to want proof, to want reassurances to know for sure that Spock didn't kill anyone. I think that anybody should do that. Anyone shouldn't just simply take it at face value. They should want, they want to hear him say it, they want proof, reassure, me, reassure them that that he did not murder anyone. But I did like that scene. I thought that was great. Um, and I think the, the way that Spock was reacting is kind of true to his character. And also, of course, true to the kind of relationship he has with Burnham, where he's like, oh, of course you would want more proof. But I so I think it works for his character, but I think uh, he's being a bit unreasonable there. Uh, but that, yeah, so that was cool. So we know that Section 31 uh, lied, or they're lying. The Spock never killed anyone. They, When they want to capture him, they want to rip the information out of his head. They're just going to kill him. They don't care about Spock because they want the information about the future um uh, Maybe not even necessarily to save humanity, partly, but they, of course, Section 31 can't be trusted in doing it for their own uh, nefarious purposes. Now, Section 31, uh, I guess, like, I'm not, I guess I'll get to them now because I'm not going to put them in the cons because they actually weren't as bad in this episode. Uh, as they were in previous episodes, especially last week's episode, I thought they were absolutely horrible. But I heard her speculation that, uh, because it, it, at the end it sort of implied that Jojo is trying to uh, out Leland and take over, which I think will happen because of the whole spinoff thing. I think she's going to be in charge of Section 31, not Leland, so I think Leland's going to be gone. But... 
I've heard like the uh, speculation that okay, well maybe Section Thirty One uh, is like going to become more like they're going to be discredited because of this incident. Starfleet's not going to trust them anymore, so that's why they're going to become more autonomous and more ominous. And that's why by the time we get to these Space Nine times, they're completely separate for, from Starfleet, and people don't think they exist because maybe they were disbanded during this time period. So people don't think. Okay, if they did that. They can do that, but it still doesn't fit. I'm sorry. I'm just, people are bending backwards to try to fit this, and but it's already inconsistent. I mentioned it. I'm going to continue mentioning this. There's no excuses, nothing they can say in Discovery that will make this fit with, I don't want to say canon, but really make this fit with what's been established on Deep Space Nine. Because as I said, and I'll say this a bit, I keep saying this, and people keep ignoring me, Deep Space Nine and Enterprise established that Section 31 were always, always, let me get this clear, always, forever, every point in time from their existence, always autonomous, never a part of Starfleet, never under Starfleet command. I'm sorry, but uh, these theories kind of irritate me because they, these people are being obtuse because they're not getting the fact that it was clearly established that these in Deep Space Nine, so they're like, oh, so this is how they're going to make it fit in the canon. Um, no, it still won't fit in the canon. I'm sorry. I mean, it would be a poor excuse. It would be like the whole thing with, with Pike saying the view screen. Okay, maybe I should have put this in the con section. But anyway, it would be the whole thing like like uh, Pike seeing the view screen and saying, oh, rip the view screens out of, the, out of the Enterprise to try to fit it. But it still doesn't fit in. And not the view screens, the hologram. It's still, it's just a poor excuse that tries to fit in the can, but it still doesn't. So if they did the same thing with Section 31, that's all it would be except worse in my opinion. So there's nothing they can do, nothing they can do to make this fit in the can. But anyway, I'm sorry, let me get back to the positives. <laughs> let, me, let me get back to the pros. Okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, what else did I get? Oh, right, let's begin into the Stamets and Culber and their relationship troubles because these scenes, this was a really good side plot to have uh, in this episode. It, this why I think this was such a powerful episode because not only did it have a really strong A plot with the delusions and seeing Spike and Burnham's relationship and tying it to the events of the cage, you also get this side plot that actually shows Culber. It doesn't be like, um, you know, just like, oh, he's back from the dead, but nobody cares. He's he's just Culber again, which, honestly, I think Game of Thrones did a little bit with, with Jon Snow. I think they kind of just brushed aside the whole fact that he was brought back to life. But the, um, with uh, Culber, I think they just showing how he's not in his right mind and how he doesn't feel like he's him and, and like, he, they, he doesn't feel like he fits in his skin. And I love his interactions with uh, Stamets. I think it is so great because Stamets from his perspective, and I love they made this clear in this episode, and I love the interactions between them, that from Stamets' perspective, this is a miracle. His lover had died. He couldn't deal with this death. It was very you know, caused him a lot of grief and all of a sudden he finds he doesn't have to, so he wants to embrace it. He wants things to go back to normal. He wants things to be uh, for this to be the miracle of him actually getting his lover back. But Culver, by doing so, he's being um, oblivious to the trauma that Culver is going through and how difficult this is for him uh, being, feeling, having the memories of being him but not actually feeling like he is him. He feels like he's a new person, but kind of the same person. It's an identity crisis that he doesn't know how to deal with or understand. And Stam is just like pushing him, you know, so hard to just go for things just to go back to normal. It's just making it worse for him. He can't go for that. So I think that a storyline, that character relationship, probably some of the best character moments. Uh, that Discovery ever did. So I really enjoyed that uh, as well. Um, I also liked um, the ending where getting back to the Talosians on how the Talosians tricked 
Section 31 when they showed up. Because when, it's funny, because when they were, like, Section 31 was trying to beam Michael and uh, Spock up, and Enterprise was latching onto them, and, and uh, Vina appeared to Spike, uh, Pike, sorry, and was like, uh, just let him go, uh, let them go. It seemed like she could have made it clear that, <laughs> that, uh, he didn't need to beam them up, that it wasn't really them, that it was an illusion. It seems like the only reason she didn't was for... Because it's not like anyone else could see her talking to Pike. Uh, so it seems like the only reason she didn't was so the audience wouldn't know, and the audience would be full. Now, I will admit I was kind of fooled only because I had a low opinion of Discovery writing. Because when this happened, I thought when Section 30 one showed up to beam um, Spock and Burnham out. I was like, why are they not? Why are the Talosians not tricking Section 31? How come they didn't make Section 31 think there was a huge black hole? Like, I didn't get that. Why aren't they? Because, and as we saw in the original episode, the cages of Talosians will, could trick people to blow up their ships if they want to. They could get them to push the wrong buttons. Uh, how come they're not doing anything? How come they're not inter interfering with Section 31 at all? Uh, and so, when it was, uh, once he did let go and it was revealed Spock and Burnham were just delusions, I was so happy. I was cheering. Because, yes, that shows that, the, because I thought the Discovery was writing was just being bad. <laughs> and they were forgetting that the Talosians had this ability and that they sh would and should trick Section 31. I can't think of any specific examples, but I can think of some in earlier episodes of Discovery where they kind of did shit like this that was inconsistent with characters for plot convenience. Because if the plot required Section 31 to get Spock and Burnham, then they would just do it and just forget about to the illusions interfering, but I love that they didn't. I love that they, they actually fooled me because I had so low expectations of their writing that they were like, no, we're actually good writers. We remember the, what the Talosians can do, and we are going to use them correctly. We are going to have them trick Section 31 to make them think they have uh, Spock and Burnham when they don't. And that moment was so satisfying, especially when, <laughs> when Michael... Again, I love the the uh, relationship, the interactions between Burnham and Spock. I love how she was just like, say goodbye, Spock. And he's like, goodbye, Spock. And then they disappeared. That was amazing. That was so great. Even though, arguably, that wasn't really Spock and Burnham. Of course, that, could have, that was just Talosians uh, <laughs> fooling them. And I love how... Giorgio, like, knew this. Like, she was like, when Leland was all high on himself, ha ha, I have you now. And, and Giorgio was like, you know, don't you think it's a, it's a bit suspect that Pike gave up? Don't you wonder why Pike gave up so easily? He was like, yeah, whatever. And once they disappeared, and he was like, oh, why didn't you tell me the Talosians could do this? Like, oh, and miss the look on your face trying to explain this to the animals? Again, this is feeding into Giorgio trying to out Leland, which I'm pretty sure is what's going to happen. So, anyway, that was great. I love it. I love how they tricked the Talosians. It was great seeing Spock finally back on Discovery and seeing him uh, reunited with Pike and uh, seeing that. Uh, so, I'm so excited to see uh, where the show goes from here. Now, let me get into the con. Uh, which I guess I turned to the whole Section 31, but as I said, they weren't actually, Section 31 themselves didn't bother me as much in this episode as they did in previous episodes. Uh, so let me get into the cons, and the first thing, because I praise the sound effects and the sound designs, the first con I want to get to is the cinematography and the visual look. This, I didn't, I wouldn't say that the director is a bad director, or the, because it's hard to know who to place the blame on the director of the cinematographer, because sometimes uh, it depends on the kind of director you have who is mostly responsible for the visual look. Uh, because usually the visual look of Discovery is something that's always the best, like the special effects, the way it looks, but I didn't like... There's nothing wrong with the special effects, but I didn't like the way this episode was shot. Uh, this episode used the most lint flares I've, I've ever remember seeing on the show. Maybe I just never noticed before, but I don't know. It's weird that I've actually noticed it this time. It was very distracting. It felt very Abrams-like, which I hated. I hate the Abrams visual style. I hate the lens flare. And just the way like all the rooms were lit, they were much more like the mess hall, for example, when we had the fight between 
uh, Colbert and um, and uh, Tyler, which there's a reason why I didn't mention that in the positive, so don't worry, I'll get back to that. <laughs> when uh, when they had that fight, when they're in the mess hall, like the visual, like the lighting is very, like it's very dim, very mood lighting, like all the lights shining through the windows. I think the other episodes of Discovery, I think, has this to a lesser extent. It f just felt extenuated. It felt like I actually had this issue with Generations as well for the lighting because the lighting was. Especially as a contrast from going from the Next Generation show to the movie where it felt a lot dimmer. It felt like there was dark and moody and purposely moody. I know why they do this. They do this to make it look more cinematic and not just have the wash out, you know, TV uh, style of the 90s, which Discovery's never had. To be fair, they never had that, and I actually think because of that wash out look, that's just done so they can get stuff done as quick as possible. Uh, and with shorter episodes and bigger budget, they don't have to do that and they can do better lighting. So I'm actually think the Discovery lighting has always been better than that. But here they take it to too much of an extreme, which is the same thing I thought Generations, the movie did. As a, in an effort to make it look more cinematic, they just make it look more dark and like purposely trying to be all moody oh look we're moody look out and i just i don't like the lighting and there's a couple there were a couple of shots particularly there was one with pike and saru in the turbo lift where they used like a weird like wide lens that made it look like it was like a really stylistic shot but it was just Pike and Saru talking, so we don't need a stylistic shot. That's something that is more used in, like, in, like if you have a, like a weird flashback, a weird memory, or a vision, or something. You use a, like a wide lens like that to make it look all strange. But they were doing this here just for normal. And I just thought it was distracting. I thought it was, it was it didn't work. I think the cinematographer and the director got too uh, carried away with trying to make things look cool that it distracted and detracted from the episode uh, rather than help the episode. Uh, so that's that's my first you know nitpick. I have to get out of the way. Uh, getting more into cons. Again, okay, let's talk about the fight scene between Colbert and Tyler. Uh, as I said, I love what they did with Colbert in this episode. I love his interactions with Stamus, but I hated that fight scene. That fight scene was so dumb. I mean, honestly, I think Colbert is a much more dynamic and much more interesting character. And to have him fall back to, oh, you killed me, so I'm going to kick your ass, is doing a disservice to his character. I think his character, the way he has been established, that he is not a violent man. Why are they turning all these? They make it's like they seem to want to make all the characters of Discovery violent, even if it goes against their character. He's not been established as a violent man. Now you may say, "Well, Mark, he was murdered. Anyone would react violently to that." They would react poorly to that, yes. They would hold resentment and anger, but not necessarily want to kick someone's ass. That's personally, I honestly think, I can't say about being brought back to life and when they <laughs> confront my murderer, but any similar situation where I have such grief with someone, that's not how I personally would handle it. I would hate them, I would hold resentment, but I wouldn't want to go in there and kick their ass. And I think that Colber has that same is that same type of character. He's established as a, 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 light, a medical man, a man of science, a man who uh, saves people's lives, and he's always had more of a non-violent demeanor. So I think he should have handled it in a different way. Again, he wouldn't be like, oh, I forgive you, Tyler, all's well. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying he should have handled that differently. I think it would have made more sense for him to, like, hold resentment for Tyler. I think they started to play this off really well, like in that first scene when he saw Tyler in the corridor and he was just looking at him like, what the fuck is he doing here, blah, blah, blah. And if they built off of that and did more of that, I think it would have worked and maybe had him do something to try to sabotage Tyler maybe or try to uh, you know get him kicked off the ship or something but the whole thing about just going in the mess hall and confronting him I think that that did not fit with this character at all it was very cheesy by the way but in the worst part of it in fact this is actually a, I, I think I laughed out loud when I saw this not laughing with the episode laughing at it for being so bad is when uh, they started fighting and Saru was like let him fight I'm like Oh, what? 
come on, that was like the cheesiest moment. And it reminded me of like the third episode of Discovery where um, the security chief, these criminals were like picked a fight with Burnham and the security chief was like, oh, let them fight it out and didn't interfere. That was pissed me off something awful because it didn't fit into Starfleet or Star Trek. And it was such a stupid cliche that was purposely trying to be edgy. And this reminded me a lot of that. Um, it was just so stupid for Saru to be like, no one interfere, let them fight it out. I'm like, oh, come on. Now, I know they try to explain this. They try to give the, an excuse and tie this into Saru's storyline of him being a predator now, which, again, I, I was actually never on board <laughs> with that much. I think it's... <laughs> It's a bit clunky in the way they're handling it, so they're trying to be like, oh, he's a predator now, so now he wants people to fight. I I don't think that excuses it. I don't, I don't buy it. I, I don't think that makes it any less stupid, any less cheesy the way he was like, oh, let them fight. Like, I literally laughed at it. It was such a bad, cliche moment. Uh, <laughs> but... You know, to be fair, I did like, you know, the aftermath of Pike talking to Saru about it. And it was like, why did you let them fight? And he was like, uh, yeah, don't do that again. Uh, <laughs> but again, like, that doesn't excuse it. Uh, to me, that's like, oh, no, it's, it's Saru acted against Pike. And Pike's pointing out how big of an idiot Saru's being. So it's just because he's a predator and now that he's doing stupid shit like that. No, 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 no. I don't buy it. I still think it's stupid. I just still think they shouldn't have done it. <laughs> anyway, um, another con. Oh, yeah. So, is the sport drive still operational or what? Because I speculated in previous episodes that the spore drive was done, that they couldn't use it anymore. That's the impression I got because that, you know, uh, what's her face? May was like, goodbye, Tilly forever. Maybe we can see each other. So I thought that meant that they're no longer able to go into the mycelial network and that the spore drive is kaput. But in this episode, they, want, they try to use the spore drive. Now, at first, I thought, oh, no, they're not able to do it. Maybe they're just not aware that they're closed off from it because when they try to do it, it wouldn't work. But that's not what's implied here. What's implied here is that somebody sabotaged the spore drive. So if this person didn't sabotage the spore drive, that they would have been able to use it. So why was me saying all these goodbyes to Tilly if they can still use the spore drive? I don't really get that. And plus, I was happy when I thought they couldn't use the spore drive anymore because that would explain why I was never using the original series Next Generation Deep Space Nine or any of that because they can't. It's closed off. So now we're seeing that it's not, that they can still use it. So I think that just creates more issues. So I wasn't very happy with that. Um, now, I did praise a lot of the Michael Burnham and Spock stuff a lot in my positives and my pros, and I do stand by that. But the one thing I will say wasn't handled the best was the revelation of how Spock and Burnham had a falling out all these years ago. First of all, I want to say I actually like the scene for itself, just judging the scene on its own, the way it was shot, the way with Burnham, how it switched from young Burnham and to old Burnham and old Spock, or to young Spock, or I should say present day Burnham and Spock to their child counterparts, the way they would constantly flip between them. I thought that was awesome. I thought that portrayed very well the kind of relationship that they had, how it still had impact on them presently, but that's it. <laughs> like, that's the, what the big falling out is, and that Burnham says that she didn't like him and wanted him to go away. I mean, that's all it is. I honestly expected something a lot more uh, than simply that. <laughs> I I expected, um, yeah, I expected Spock and, and Burnham's falling out to have a lot. I mean, because this is something they've been teasing, and this is something Burnham's like, I don't want to talk about it. And it seems like the only reason he says not want to talk about it is because the, episode, the plot wasn't required for the audience to know. And it's funny, also the way the Talosians uh, demanded this as payment for this is like, well, we want this as payment because the audience watching needs to this exposition at this moment. <laughs> it did feel a lot like that and, and it felt a bit uh, clunky in that regard. And again, it's like, I mean, and plus I didn't, they didn't explain much of why Burnham as a child was doing this because they, she kind of talked about how they, um, you know, they, um, 
there was a, an extremist uh, Vulcan group that was one that wanted to kill them, and if she was still there, she would try to kill. They would try to kill her, and Spock might die, so she was leaving for his safety. Uh, maybe they touched on this in previous episodes, uh, but I'm just not remembering. But if that's the case, I think they could have touched on it more. I think they could have made this more clear. Particularly in this episode, they needed to make it more clear. I didn't really get that. That seemed to come out of nowhere. Uh, and so it seemed kind of fake stakes. And again, like, I don't buy that Spock in present times still holds this much resentment towards Burnham. Uh, because because even in present times, he acknowledges, oh, I understand logically why you did this. You were just trying to sever emotional ties with me because you were leaving for the safety or whatever. Uh so why does he still hate her if he understands logically that she actually did care for him and she was just doing that uh, to save his life and why does he hold all this resentment towards her still I, that, I, that just doesn't make sense I don't think it fits I don't think it's particularly good uh, storytelling so that part I thought was a bit of a uh, letdown now last little con negative I want to get into is the whole thing with um, the Starfleet admirals uh, talk, ordering Section 31 and, and telling them to, uh, you know, get Spock. I got the impression from this conversation, because these guys, they were wearing Starfleet uniforms, they weren't wearing the black leather things, and I think they, <clears throat> it was hard to tell because they were holograms, but I think they had like normal Starfleet baggage badges that they were in Section 31. Uh, because if they were... I'm bringing this up because if they were Section 31, that would that would make more sense. That would make sense why they were being such dicks and being like, oh, we have to trap Spock here and we have to trap Burnham here. They're all outlaws or fugitives. Fuck them. But the fact that it's Starfleet who's doing this pisses me off. I think this is really out of character for Starfleet. I, I, I don't think that they should be acting like this. I think they're being very obtuse. Um... The fact that they, you know, are just falling for this bullshit that Section 31 is selling all, all so easily. This is this is not what's the way Starfleet should be portrayed, uh, as I said. And, and, like, at the end of the episode where it turns out Discovery are, like, outlaws and Starfleet's going to be hunting them down because they broke the law, like, that was all stupid, too. Like, I think they're trying too hard to create tension. They're trying too hard to create a dilemma where Discovery's on its own. But this... The way they're portraying Starfleet is is not how Starfleet should behave. They shouldn't be this obtuse. They shouldn't be this stupid. They shouldn't be uh, trying to hunt down like uh, yeah. So that whole thing I'm not happy with, and I think from the previews of next episode it seems like they we're going to get more of that. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm very dubious about that. Although like yeah, touching briefly more on the positive though, uh, some people brought up the fact that. Uh, t going to tell us for in the menagerie was a death sentence. Some people were like, oh, they mentioned it was off limits, but why didn't they mention the death penalty? I'm glad that they didn't, because I, when I did a review of the menagerie and I talked about the menagerie, I really bashed that. That was so stupid that uh, having having a death, you know, death penalty just for going on planet, that's completely out of character for Starfleet. Now, granted, I think... Yeah, this episode of the original series was, like, earlier episodes before they even established, like, Starfleet or what it was and what its principle was. So I can excuse that for being doing something that's so out of character for Starfleet, but I couldn't excuse Discovery for it. Uh, so I'm glad Discovery is like, no, well, let's just pretend that doesn't exist. And I suppose you could say that maybe they'll make up the death penalty thing later after this latest incident where they trick Section 31, and that's when they come up with the whole death penalty thing. But honestly, I hope they just forget the whole deal and just try to pretend that never happened, because that's stupid. <laughs> anyway... Uh, my rating for, um, if memory serves, out of 10 is a 9. Excellent. Almost a 10. But those cons, they got in the way. <laughs> like the whole Col Colbert's uh, Tyler fight, that eliminates us from getting a 10. But 
definitely a very strong nine. Very great episode. In fact, I have to say, I think this is probably the best episode of the season so far. Uh, maybe even the best episode of the entire show uh, so far. I, I love uh, what they did with the Talosians. I love the character story with Pike, seeing him reunited with Vina. And I love seeing Michael Burnham and Spock finally together and their interactions. This is all handled extremely well. Uh, so, really good episode. Anyway, that is it. Uh, for my review of Star Trek Discovery Season 2, Episode 8. I will be back next week uh, to review Discovery as always. Uh, thank you so much for watching, so make sure to check out my channel for that as I do many more Star Trek uh, reviews and also cover other shows like The Expanse, Game of Thrones, Lost, and more, so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that, and thanks a lot for watching.